you who've heard a lot of this material before, isn't it wonderful that there's going to be some revision for you? Um, because you also know from me, how many times does an adult have to hear something before we actually start to take it in? At least seven. Oh, let me count. Okay. Um, and so if you know this, hallelujah, what's happening is that more connections are being laid down in your brain to remember it better. So I just want to, um, in acknowledging um, our country here on Nuna, that there may be material today that um, contains images of Indigenous Australians who've died. So here's what we're covering today. Um, we're just going to look at the first thousand days when things go right. If you're interested in when things go wrong, that's what my workshop tomorrow is on. Today we're only looking about when things go right and we're going to look at the incredible interplay and dance between brains, bonding and books. Um, and I hope by the end of it that you are as excited about this um, as I get, as you will see. Okay, the first thousand days, I just really want to honour Professor Kerry Arabina from the University of Melbourne, um, whose words are, the first thousand days between a woman's pregnancy and her child's second birthday offers a unique window of opportunity to shape healthier and more prosperous futures. Because what we are really on about is prevention. Is, is preventing the kind of stories that we heard yesterday in the symposium for kids. For kids who struggle with mental health issues because of difficulties with reading. For, um, for kids who struggle with, um, with receptive and expressive language where life may have been different for them um, if they've been read to. And so honour Kerry in that. And if you want to follow through, and you will get copies of these slides and information post-conference in a Dropbox, so no need to take lots of info. Um, but her organisation, the first thousand days australia.org.au, chase it up. Um, it, it's, a, um, it's an amazing organisation that really supports um, first thousand days for our Indigenous communities. So brains, what are we born with? What makes brains grow? And again, as I said, revision. And, um, and you can all answer these questions because it's not rocket science. It is not rocket science. But in many ways, early brain development is. Okay, so what are we born with in the first thousand days from conception to birth? This, it's not because I love numbers, but I just love the immensity of what's happening in utero. Um, my favourite undergraduate um, course was um, neuroanatomy, closely followed by embryology. And I will always remember our embryology lecturers just waxing eloquent about these amazing changes that, that are happening in our babies before we even know we're pregnant. So by, um, by the time our bumps are a month old in utero, they've got 10,000 brain cells. Huge number of brain cells by four weeks, when you're just probably reckoning that you might be pregnant. And as the list goes down by two months, it's not, it hasn't tripled, it's whatever it is by 10 to someone who's mathematic, help me there. Look at three months, we're up to a million brain cells by a million, by three months. By four, four months it's tripled, and as we go on, and this is really critical for those of us who work with preemie bumps, look what happens between six months and nine months the incredible, incredible complexity in brain changes that are happening between six and nine months. And when are our pretty bugs born? In that period. And so that brain development for them has to, um, has to be happening in the new units. And we'll do a little bit on that. But don't you think that is the most amazing, the most amazing, amazing organ in our bodies? Okay, so... The first 280 days conception to birth, 
language acquisition starts happening in utero. And that's because the auditory system is developing in the second trimester. Think about that. For what's going on for you, for what babies will start hearing in the second trimester between three and six months. And by the third trimester, this is phenomenal, they're able to hear environmental sounds and recognise familiar passages of speech. Now here's a little bit of revision for those of you who were there for the 2017 conference when Dr Marina Kalashnikova, gosh I love that name, from the Baby Lab in Western Sydney was talking about research that was done with, um, with pregnant mums in the third trimester. They were sent home with a book to read. They had to read the same book to their unborn baby every day. And then they came back to the lab the following week, put the fetal um, heartbeat on, mum read the book again, they did the fetal heart rate, their mum was given a different book to read. Revision for those of you who were there two years ago, what happened to the fetal heart rate then? Remember? See what revision's good? It changed. It went up. Baby was hearing a different sound. Baby had got used to that sound of the rhythm of the story in that one week alone and by the second time, and we're talking about unborn bubs, their fetal heart rate changes. Don't you think that's absolutely amazing? It blows me away completely. And, um, and I just want to highlight here, when we look at that third trimester, I'm commenting again on the NIC unit, where we talk about the brain development that happens between six and nine months. For you to think about in your communities, and we'd love to start it here at WA. But an amazing grandmother at the John Hunter Hospital um, in Newcastle, on the, in the east. Um, her little lum, she had um, twin grandsons born premier at about 26 weeks. And, um, and sadly one of them died and one went home. And the thing that this grandma learned, and this is about the power of, of Paint the Town Red at a community level, she said, we need to do things differently. We need to do things differently for our parents in the new world. And so in partnership with Paint the Town Red and Paint the Lake Red, which is the local um, Paint the Town Red community, we've now set up a, um, a donation giving page on our Just Giving page for Paint the Town Red. And um, every baby that goes into the NIC unit receives a new book. Not the normal books we give to bubs at birth because those parents need to sit often for hours talking to their baby. Often they cannot touch their baby for some time, but they can talk with their bub. And, um, and so here it's a possum magic. Yeah. And um, so they can spend time talking for five, ten minutes with their bub. And so if bub goes home, that is bub's first book that's been read with them. And if bub sadly doesn't go home, parents can take that book home as part of their special bonding memory, as part of their special feeling memory. Um, Arona, the grandma who's headed up and leading this program, would love it to come to WA. She's part of Paint Town Re, which is just starting. And she said, anyone in WA, let's put our hands up and do it for the NIC units. Because those NIC units show us what's happening for babies' brains. And that's just a photo from the, um, the NIC at um, John Hunter. So the power of language, that's why we read talks in with our bubs from pre-birth, because our bubs can hear us. Okay, what happens in the next 722 days post-birth? Okay, you've all seen this slide for those of you who work with me. Here's again, and this one's more on brain weight development. We've moved from cells to weight. Look what happens between birth and two years. We've got a brain that triples in weight. How phenomenal is that? By the time we're five, our baby's brain will weigh pretty well close to what it is as an adult. Don't you think that's amazing? Who's got the most important job on the planet um, after parents? I reckon it's our early childhood staff who often don't get the kudos that they need. But the early childhood staff are often the secondary carers coming in to provide that language. And we should do everything we can as communities to support our early childhood workers in this place. 
Okay, so come on, you guys all know this one. What helps baby's brain to grow? How come it can grow from 350, 400 grams at birth to about 800 grams at 12 months? We know babies have to be fed well and all the important stuff around that. We know babies need good sleep patterns and good routines. But unless something else is happening for baby, their brains won't grow or won't grow to the same extent. Down in the front. Yes, thank you, Helen. There's something else that happens is every time we look, talk, sing, read with and touch our babies from birth, we literally grow their brains. And so this dad here giving his first bath, his first bath, what is happening there between dad and mum? We're getting connection and we're getting amazing growth in baby's brain. Amazing growth in his brain. He's being held by his dad, he's feeling the touch of the water, he can see his dad and he can hear his dad's voice. That relationship that's happening is building that little fella's brain. And this is a slide you all know, because we know that every time we read, talk and sing with our babies from birth, their brain grows. And for those of you, you know, here am I with, I can't do the pointers, I'm about to point on the screen because that's all good. Um, the first slide on the left is a simple, you know, it's, it's a graphic drawing of what our brain cells look a bit like, could look like um, under the microscope of birth. The big black blobs are the cell, excuse me, the cell nuclei and the skinny bits all coming out of it are the dendrites, okay, the little skinny arms that come out of the cell and the synapses is where those little skinny arms connect up with each other. Um, and basically, and Dr. Fred Hart, you're going to correct me on this because it's always good to have an expert in the room. Um, whenever we read talks in with our buds from birth, the little black blobs stay the same, but those little dents aren't having that, we won't get the same growth, we won't get the same connections. So the middle slide is bubble at five, and the next slide along is bubble at 14. And as you can see, adolescence is the second most important part of brain development. And I'd love to talk about that today, but we're here for the under fives. But just to say in adolescence, we lose at least a third of our connections, don't we? Around that, it basically, if we don't use it, we lose it, particularly in adolescence. And then some amazing things happen called myelination, which, um, which makes it the, the connections that remain even faster and stronger and hold on for longer. So you can see if you're working with your young mums who are still in that developmental adolescent to 25 stage, um, who they're with and what they do has importance not just for their babies but for their own brain because it's going to be even tougher to change things for them once they've gone past that development. Isn't that fascinating? See, I could stay here all day talking about adolescence, but today is not about adolescence. But it is an ad for the amazing high school teachers who are present today. And I'm looking at Michelle over here from Yorgan and Southern Cross. And the reason why Michelle got involved was because she was tired of kids turning up to high school not being able to read. And she said, I want to do something about it. Round of applause for Michelle. Um, and so that's the story. Every time we read, talk, sing with our babies, we help those brain cells grow. Okay, you've all seen this slide before. This is revision, but isn't revision a wonderful thing? Post-birth, when are the really sensitive times for growing our baby's brains? Have a look, because we're talking about the first thousand days, which is up to two. I go to point at it again, but just look for two. Um, and where does the main development happen? When is our brain most sensitive for vision, hearing, habitual ways of responding? 
getting, you know, getting our style of relating going, language development, emotional language, and, I almost get, and um, they're the key ones that happen by the time we do. Our brain gets attuned for vision, hearing, habitually responding in situations and language development by the time we're two. We're going to come back to language because it's critical. As, as Rhonda will tell you as a um, high school, primary school principal, um, how critical language is for arriving at school for reading and as we learned yesterday. And then we get symbol, which is to do with our mathematics. We get our peer social skills and our relative quantity coming in later, but boy, they're peaked by three. So by the time lots of our kids enter our early childhood service, the most sensitive time is over. When is the most important time? In the baby's room. I have a, I have a dream that our wonderful Rotary partners who read in schools with kids will say, I also want to go and read in the baby's room at the local childcare centre, where the baby's room staff often don't have as, as the time that they would like to spend that time doing reading. So let's get, wouldn't it be great to get the whole senior sector of our community reading in babies and flexibility and the most amazing directors, but I reckon we could do it. But don't you, I just get blown away by that. By the time our bubs are two, look how much has happened in their brains. And that is the time when we can make changes Certainly we can make changes after they're two and um, having worked as a therapist um, with bugs um, older than two, yes, we can make changes and yes, there are amazing miracles and yes, there is brain flexibility and brain plasticity. I say yes, 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 yes. But I tell you, the time, the energy on parents' part, the stress on parents and as we know, the stress on those bugs, yes, we get success but at a cost. So let's try and get it right for our pumps from, from now. And so that's why you guys are here. Okay, let's go down to the, the brain in more detail. Um, so the first 12 months, our brain weight increases by 101%. Are you with me on that? But there's a special part of our brain for the right subcortical unconscious part of our brain that increases by 130%. It's a part of the brain that grows the most in our first 12 months of life. And I'm really indebted. I know you guys in WA have had Stuart Shanky here. Is that right? So you guys are going to roll your eyes at me. But remember, revision is important. Revision is very important. Um, so Stuart's work and Alan Shaw's work have, have really impacted on the way um, we think about brain development and, and their whole tribe of people. So it's this right subcortical part of brain. I remember talking to Stuart Shanker once about and I said, look, I'm sure in my neurodevelopment we didn't have a right and a left at that point. We just, but that he said that was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, and I said, well, what happens in the left subcortical? And he said, frankly, we don't really know yet. Um, so it, it's, 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 but let's just go for this part of our brain. And I want us to think about this because this is critical for books and bonding your brains. Because what's so special about the right subcortical part of our brain or the lower part of our brain, which um, for those of you who've done it with me before, it's the part of our brain where your thumb just comes in underneath your skull. And might I tell you, it's a part of the brain for bubs I've worked with who are part of shaking baby, because what happens when bubs' heads are shaken? This part can get really impacted on. So it's subconscious and it's pre-language. Because, and oh, again, I just get so excited about this when you look at diagrams of brains, if you like diagrams of brains. Um, when we touch our babies, when we look at our babies, when we speak to our babies, guess what? Guess what part of the brain fires first? This part of our brain. This is the bit where all that information goes to. Can you see why it grows by 130% compared to the rest of our brain? Because this is the part of our brain that as babies that is pumping, or not pumping as the case may be for some. But this is a, for, for the normal bumps, this is the part of our brain that's pumping. And you know what? It's pumping even when we're asleep. It never goes to sleep. 
It may change a little bit, but it will never, never, ever go to sleep. Because it has to do with bonding. So we know that brains, every time we read talks, seeing rhyme with bugs from birth, their brains grow. You got that? We good? I'm putting my hand up not to make you be quiet, but... <laughs> good. Okay, this next one, this is probably the most critical slide because that right subcortical has to do with bonding. Bonding, attachment, regulation. Attachment, this is Harrison's book, um, Linda Harrison, it's a really great early childhood Australia book. It's still my Bible for working in early childhood centres. And if you don't work in an early childhood centre, it's still a great book to get because it looks at attachment, the different types of attachment, how it plays out in peer relations. Because remember, peer relations happens when we're about peaking about three. This stuff has to happen before we can peak with peer relations. So it's something that affects all of us. It describes our unique human ability to form lasting relationships with others and to maintain those relationships over time and distance. And it's the one I always say, when you walked in here today or you walked in here yesterday, upstairs yesterday, what was one of the first things you did? Hello? You looked around for people you knew because they will be coming in the same place. And if you like me sometimes, if I don't know people at a conference, my safe place becomes the cappuccino corner. I go there to get a coffee. We go to places where we feel safe and the relationships, the importance of having attachment with each other stays with us for the rest of our lives. Now our first attachment is with our mums, our primary caregiver. Now what a surprise. The primary mode that we develop attachment is, guess what? Shared gaze, touch, sound. Where have you heard that before this morning? Every time we read talk, sing with bugs, their brains grow. Every time we read talk, sing with our bugs, we actually build bonding. But there is a very special part of bonding here because it's all to do with our old right subcortical. Remember, it's subconscious, pre-language. Here it is, what fires first? Gaze, touch, water. Isn't that amazing? I know that. And it's a dance. And this is one of Stuart Shanker's slides. Um, how do we know all this stuff? It's because they've been able to put on these big dark EEG caps on mums and bums, and they've watched what happens with, with mums and bums when they interrelate with each other, when they, when they talk to each other, when they look at each other, when mum holds them. The amazing thing is, I remember what Stuart said to you here, um, they, he's at York University and um, What's his foundation called? Someone help me? Yeah. Um, anyhow, he says he has an 85% success rate with little bugs with autism getting those caps on. Now, from a therapeutic point of view, I just think he's amazing. But they can get these caps on bugs. Um, and what they do is that they then look at what's happening in mum's brain and what's happening in baby's brain and what happens between the two. And this is what is absolutely amazing. As mum holds bub and talks to bub and sings with bub, bub's brain comes into sync with mum's brain. And where does it come into sync? That's it, in the right subcortical. That's the area it comes into sync. So in mum's right subcortical, is under stress, because that's where our stress first starts in. What's Bub's right subcortical going to be like? It's going to struggle in the same way that Mum's does. And Mum's the primary carer. So Bub's, don't you think that's fascinating? It's the most amazing, amazing dance between Mum and Bub. What's happening in Mum's, bub, Mum's brain as she holds her Bub is mirrored in, in Bub's brain. Okay, so hold that thought. So we're going back to this little fella when he's about a day old. Well, um, he's got a brain that's 35, 350 grams. He's got his primitive reflexes. He's got his...
because we know that sensitive period starts in which trimester? Second, for auditory. And he's also got, at that stage, what we call his primitive emotional circuits. He's got fight or flight. And we know that because we know bugs can look away from us. Sure, their visual acuity with us is in that breast to eye. That's when they can see us the best when they're born. But if they're frightened, they can look away. And that's the first thing they'll do. They'll look away as part of their flight. But what don't they have? You're holding, you're hanging in there with me. You can do this, you can do this. What's missing? And this is the critical one. The OT and me will want to talk about sensory integration and motor planning, but don't let me. What we need that's missing is this self-regulation. Mums, remember with your bubs, the whole wrapping and everything. Bubs don't have temperature control. Bubs don't have respiratory rate control. Bubs don't have heart rate control when they're born. Where do they get those from? Mum. They get their heart rate control, they get their respiratory rate control. How do they get it? By holding and touching and talking. And that starts happening in that right subcortical. Don't you think it's the most fascinating part of the brain? I think it's the most fascinating part of the brain. <coughs> okay, so how do babies learn to regulate? Literally every time mum looks, touches, talks, sings and reads with her baby, connections grow and baby's brain waves come into sync with mum's and we call it regulation. So I want you to go away from today, we talk about attachment theory, Stuart Schenker's big thing and Alan Shaw's thing is let's start calling it regulation because the power of that relates, it's about attachment, but, but the purpose of attachment is for baby to learn to self-regulate in this part of the brain. And we just use bonding because we need liberation to go with brains. If we had another word for brains that started with R, we would have used that. Um, but, and to go with books. So bonding equals attachment equals regulation. And a secure bonding creates two types of self-regulation for bum at this part of their brain. You, are you with me? Because this, oh, I just get fascinated. Okay, the first type we call is the interactive regulation through interaction with others. So that's the first one that happens when bum's born through with them with mum, by learning to regulate because they're with mum. You with me? But once, and they need to have that before they can regulate on their own. Before they can regulate well on their own. Got it? So we have to be able to be regulated by, um, and I say mums, meaning primary caregiver, or our early childhood worker when we're in bumps room, um, or our nan, or our aunt, or part of the whole mom. So we need to regulate, we pick up our regulation from them and once we've got that, we can start to regulate for ourselves. And this dance goes on from before we're born. And um, I'm coming back to the stuff we learn from little bums who are struggling to live in the um, NIC units. Uh, there was an amazing um, nurse, and I think she's from South Africa, where in their um, neonatal intensive care, twins were born. But sorry, it's not these two, it's the only photo I can find of twins in, and I need to get a better one. Um, and they didn't have enough humidity proofs, so she, they, the twins were put the, in, the, in the two, the two twins were put in the humidity crib together, and when um, a second humidity crib became available, they separated them. Now, this very astute nurse noticed, well, guess what? You can tell me. For those of you who know, for those of you who are only hearing it for the first time, guess what happened to the weaker of the twins? Because usually with premier twins, one is stronger and one is weaker. What happened to the weaker one on separation? Heart rate, respiratory rate, that had been stable, started to track downwards. And this very, very, very amazing nurse said, hmm, I wonder. And she put them back together again. And what happened? Baby stabilised, weaker twins stabilised. And from there went a whole lot of thinking around, what is happening? 
This is rocket, this really is rocket science. These are preemie bugs before they're born and somehow the weaker twin is stabilising by being in the presence of its strong. Don't you think that's amazing? And it's just phenomenal. That's happening in the first 280 days and it happens for the rest of our lives. Sleeping spouses, partners, the same things happen, guys. Your right subcortical comes into sync with your partner's right subcortical when you're asleep. You can always blame them for a rocky night's sleep. Um, I've had a bad night's sleep because I'm sharing a room with Robert. No, that's right. <laughs> um, but it's true, this interactive dance goes on. And so it's really important. You know, again, working with adolescents, who do our adolescents hang out with? Who do they get their interactive regulation from? Each other. Hey, something to think about. Oh, fascinating. Okay, so how it all fits together. Bonding is the key mechanism through which baby's brain develops. You with me? Mum's brain is teaching baby's brain to regulate through the shared communication, that, inter that relationship. And this is a really critical one for us. For those of us who are involved in the, in the point of your work more, um, you can't change a baby's brain unless the brain of the caregiver is regulated. And I can remember as a therapist, as a fairly green therapist, I thought I could go in and change those babies' lives. Because I knew what to do. No. I, Mum didn't and I did, basically. Which is a terrible, terrible, terrible way of thinking. But unless we do stuff with mum, Bub's brain isn't going to change. So our primary work is with mums and dads and the, and the extended mob. Sure, it's with babies, but our purpose is for mum, for mum to be able to be regulated. So let's think about how we work with families and where do we put our support in for mums? Where do we really support mums to be regulated? And tomorrow in the workshop, um, we can do some thinking about that together. Okay, so bonding brains and books. A secure bonding attachment is the basis for all learning, including early literacy. Because we all know this, it's only when mum is regulated at that right subcortical that they can learn. It's the same for us. You know when you're really under stress, a bit like I was this morning coming in for the poor committee who had to sit with me, um, that um, some of them would say a question to me, and I was so stressed out about how we were getting things organised that I couldn't hear them. I couldn't take it in because my right subcortical was acting rather crazily. And by the about five minutes, they were probably starting to feel uncomfortable. Why were they starting to feel uncomfortable? No, Fee, because she's got a really regulated right subcortical. <laughs> but, um, but I would bet that there was a point where they're starting to get a little bit niggity because they were picking up my erratical right subcortical. And Fee was very good because she said something very calming to me that flipped me. Thank you, Fee. Um, because that's the thing, we pick it up from each other, we do it for the rest of our lives. And for a bug, this little bug sitting here out in the heat of the NT is so self-regulated, is so interregulated with her mum. What does that allow her to do? It allows her to completely focus on the book. She doesn't need to feel uncomfortable with who she's sitting in. She's well and truly into the nine months stranger danger time but she is so secure in her mum's lap that she can give her total attention to the book. And here we come into books. So we've got brains. Every time we read talk scene with bugs from birth, what happens? Brains grow. Every time we read talk scene with bugs from birth, we build regulation in our babies. Okay? Here we go. And here, here's where language development comes in because our bugs need to be well regulated before they can learn their language. And we already know from the lovely Dr. Marina that the first days after birth, bugs already have a preference for their native tongue. Why is that? Because they've heard it from the second trimester. That's the language they know. They also have a preference for us doing ga 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 infant directed speech, it's called in technical terms, but you know when you pick up a baby and we make gooey sounds that we would never make to anybody else. <laughs> we are attuned to make those gooey sounds. And that's because 
Bahman's tortoise, that's what they love. And surprise, 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 the voice that Bart will respond to more than anybody else's is whose? Mum's, because whose voice has she been listening to for the last six months? Mum. So this is just a reminder from yesterday, but this is part of the sensitivity for the first two years. By nine to 10 months, We've already got the sound categories of our native language and the ability to recognise multiple familiar words. And the sound, the, lang the languages that we're not hearing, those sounds start to drop from our vocabulary. And by 12 months, we've got our first words. By 18 months, remember that sensitive period up to two? This, this knocks me away all the time. The number of words that Bub understands by the time they're 18 months old is indicative of how well she's going to learn to read at school. It's not three, it's 18 months old. The how many words that our Bub understands by 18 months is indicative. And it's the dance of language. Because we talked about the interaction between mum and Bub. And it's critical here, how often a mum initiates with a conversation uh, isn't predictive of language development, it's how often she responds. So when bub speaks, or gestures, or makes a sound, if mum responds, that's what's going to flick into language development. It's not the barrage that we might give as anxious mums to our bubs. It's how we respond to our babies because that's the part of the regulation. It's another dance that's going on. It's a dance here, in this case, between auntie and nephew, um, of her engaging and responding to his invitation to play with her. And I'm just a quick word here for glue ear, and I hope this is your world. This, for our bugs with glue ear, um, what are they going to miss out on in that first two? Um, years, they're going to miss out on critical sounds. And a wonderful neuro neuroscientist who's worked with us um, over in the East in the Graffin Institute um, was telling me that if a bug doesn't hear a particular sound for 30 days, that part of their brain goes off to do something else. It says, I'm not needed anymore, I'm going to go and find because brain flexibility, I'm going to go and do something else. And it's the intermittent hearing her issues with the tightest media. We've got a great preventative program in the lab there. But just, so, and, and therefore it comes the importance of home language. The first days after birth, remember, it's, it's the home language. Where is our vocab the strongest? Where have we got most words? Our home language, not our second language. And the other really interesting thing that, um, um, that I think Mary was talking about yesterday afternoon with um, the vocab, it's not just the words, but how we pronounce the words. Because how we pronounce vocab in our second language is often not as clear as it is in our first. So it's also the language of our heart and our extended family. So, so, so important for home language. Why books are important, this is Ted Mellish's work coming out of Oxford. The most important effects for, and I've got a Finish, um, but this is just his thoughts. The most important impact for kids matriculating for literacy in the UK back in 2015 for their research was, it's the red ones of course, because we paint the town red, um, it's the mother's education level. That's the most important predictor of literacy at 16. And why is that? Because it's the number of words she speaks at home. So just quickly, why books? Because books will introduce words into families that they may not necessarily hear otherwise. Um, so let's get more vocab going into homes. Um, the number of words above understands by the time they're 18 months, and it's also great for bonding and regulation, but that's another story. And if you want to ask me over morning tea, I can tell you about the research program on neglected babies in New South Wales. So the first thousand days when things go right, the intricate dance, every time we touch, look, sing, and read with our bugs, brains grow and are regulated, bonding takes place, books and language and learning development. And this is a bug who was read to by birth, 
by a dad who sees this as his most important role in the family. And what his wife says is what's really good is it gives dads, particularly um, dads who aren't quite sure what to do, um, you know, in those early days, something definite that they can sit and do with their bar when they can't do the boo boo ga ga. Um, and she said, this has been amazing in the family. Now, can you, I have gone over time, because I always do, because I get excited about your own. There's our intricate dance, let's all read, talk, sing. And the thing is, what we do in Paper Town Red is not rocket science, like Kim Beasley was talking. It is not rocket science while we gather here, but boy, what's happening in babies' brains is. Um, are you happy to go for five minutes long? This is terrible. I'm the MC, I can do that. Can I? <laughs> can I give you a word from our sponsor? Um, the chairman of our board who couldn't be here, or the chairperson of our board? Hi everyone, my name is Kate Arthur and I'm the chairman of the Paper Town Red Limited Board. And I wanted to extend a really warm welcome to everyone to what is our seventh National Community Literacy Conference, Books and Bonding Builds Brains. The conference committee have worked tirelessly over the last few months to bring you an agenda jam-packed with really insightful and thought-provoking keynote speakers and workshops. And I know you're going to really enjoy the next few days. I'm sorry to come with you in person. I'm expecting another baby, the newest addition to the Arthur and Paper Town Red family, uh, which is preventing me from travelling at the moment. But in thinking about this time in my life, as well as what I wanted to say to you all today, um, really took me back to when I first got involved in Paper Town Red, which was about five years ago now before I had started my family. Um, and really thinking about, I guess, what kind of mother I wanted to be. And I knew that reading was certainly something that I wanted to do with my children. That was something that my mum did with me. It was part of the parenting toolkit, I guess, that she's handed down. Um, but I never really understood the science of it, or the why it's really important. And that is what Paper Town Red is all about. It's all about making sure that everyone in Australia and all children have that opportunity to start school ready to read and write. And the way that we do that is by celebrating literacy and encouraging everyone to read, talk, sing and write with their kids right from birth. So in that vein, I wanted to share with you I guess the journey that we've documented of Jensen and Amy, my children, um, of their reading journeys um, and how that's really impacted their lives and their development and really set them up for, I guess, success in their learning and their development as they move into um, a primary school and obviously into high school and, and into life. So, again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Enjoy the conference, and I hope to see you all soon. What we are really on about is prevention. It's, it's preventing the kind of stories that we heard yesterday in the symposium for kids. For kids who struggle with mental health issues because of difficulties with reading. For, um, for kids who struggle with, um, with receptive and expressive language, where life may have been different for them um, if they've been read to. And so I honour Kerry in that. And if you want to follow through, and you will get copies of these slides and information post-conference in a Dropbox, so no need to take lots of info. Um, but her organisation, the first thousand days Australia.org.au, chase it up. Um, it, it's, a, um, it's an amazing organisation that really supports um, first thousand days for our Indigenous communities. Page on our Just Giving page for Paint Town Red. And um, every baby that goes into the NIC unit receives a new book. Not the normal books we give to Bubs at birth because those parents need to sit often for hours talking to their baby. Often they cannot touch their baby for some time, but they can talk with their bub. Thank you so much.